All right, it's time for May to be wrapped up and we have, we have a lot to wrap up. So I'm going to point to videos as the relevant and try not to make this too long. Although I have been in a rambly mood lately, so we'll see how that goes. This has been the best quality and quantity reading month I have had in a long time. I have read 15 books somehow. Well, I know how. A lot of them were novellas and on the shorter end, I think I had four audiobooks and normally I only do like one audiobook a month. And I did look at the page counts. I did physically read less pages than in April. So the audiobooks helped a lot. But like, I even looked, I have so many genres I read. It was, I need to diversify my genre reading more often and page count of books more often because this was just like fantastic. So I'm really happy. And as per usual, if you're new to my wrap ups, I'm just going to break things into categories. I will have those timestamps down below along with affiliate links to bookshop.org. If you hear something, you're like, ooh, I want to buy this book. I do receive a commission if you use those, but no pressure. And let's go. The first one, since it was May, which is the month with Mother's Day here in the United States, I had so many books where motherhood was like a very prominent theme. <laughs> like, what do I have? I have one, two, three, six books. There could have been a seventh, but I moved it to a different category because I didn't think it was as prominent. Six of the 15 books I read were very heavily tied to the theme of motherhood. That was completely by accident. But it's very thematic to do it this month. And let's start with kind of sort of least favorite to favorite. But I do think there is an audience for each of these books, especially with this first one, which is Shuggy Bane. Now I've talked about this a lot in my Friday Reads videos. So we're gonna make this kind of brief because I kind of go into it there. But this is a very dark, depressing, trauma filled story. So if you don't want those things, don't read the book. It is a historical fiction in 1980s, think Glasgow, Scotland, and it is the only book that has ever triggered my anxiety based off my personal life experiences. So I can say that for what I have representation for in the book, which is tied more to a child dealing with a parent with drug abuse problems, that's the representation that I take. There's a lot of other stuff going on in this book. It was represented well almost too well like I it was so immersive in its writing style and I was so triggered it was a lot so if I think about it without my emotional experience maybe it's a three and a half four star read there were some things that like this is a debut work where I was like eh, I don't know if I liked that plot point put here or I don't know I didn't love everything about it if I didn't put in my emotional experience but I rate on enjoyment <laughs> And I actively did not enjoy my time to the point where I was depressed for two days. So it's it's getting a two star for me, unfortunately. That doesn't mean it's a bad work. It doesn't mean you might not gain something from it. But as I like, I've been telling people in my life, it's like I was forced to be a part of somebody else's therapy session for a thing that I also have done therapy for. And I didn't want to be there for it. Now, real talk, I wouldn't have picked it up if it weren't for my book club, but it was for a book club. And there came a point where probably I should have DNF'd it, but like then all of the pain would have been for nothing. I couldn't have like really discussed it at book club and lots of people liked it. Lots of people didn't just know it's really, really traumatic. It is not happy. <laughs> I know some people at book club were like, there's hope. And I'm like, not enough for like, for me, I like a little more balance or I like to be able to distance myself. And I could not do that with this work, but there is a lot of motherhood because there is a parent figure, a mom to the kid, Shuggy Bane. That is a very prominent part of this story. That connection for me, I didn't like because it was very unhealthy and toxic, but for other people, they loved it. They were like, oh, that's what kept me going. And I'm like, okay, to each their own. That's the first one. I'm done talking about that book. I never want to talk about that book again. Now it's going to the next one. This is Burning Roses. I read this for the Asian Readathon. I have a whole vlog with five books that I read for the Readathon because there were five prompts. And this one I picked up because it was a Chinese American author and it was kind of a little Red Riding Hood and um, an archer from Chinese folklore retelling mashed together. It was supposed to be these middle-aged women that go on adventures together or something. That's all I really knew when I picked up this novella. And I liked it, but I didn't love it. And I think it's because uh, there was a lot of theme of motherhood and failure as a parent because you are this hero figure. 
And I didn't mind that, but since it became such a big theme, I wanted more time with the family element. And really all the stories that were being told were the past, primarily of Little Red Riding Hood and her I don't know, her regrets. It was very self-centered, even though that was kind of the whole issue. I don't know. I didn't really love how the theme played out, but I have heard other people who really liked it and connected with it. I'll leave down below Judith's review for this book because she had a more positive take on it and is really good at talking about the themes eloquently. It was perfectly fine. I love how beautiful the cover is, and I'm glad I read it for the readathon, but I don't think this is going to be a book that I think about like four or five months down the road. Next one is a memoir I read for that same readathon, and this is All You Can Ever Know by Nicole Chung. This is a book I have been meaning to read, oh, since before I even knew there was booktube. I think 2018, I think I saw an interview with the author on like The Daily Show or something, and I like put it on my Goodreads. And I needed a nonfiction for the readathon, so I picked it up. This is a nonfiction of about a woman who is Korean American, but adopted by white parents. And it's about how she decides to reach out to her birth parents and birth family while being pregnant with her first kid. And it's, it's, it's her story. It's her recounting that. I thought it was really good. I, I was always gripped by it. It was my one of my audiobooks. Sometimes audiobooks, I'm not excited to pick them up. I'm not engaged by them, but I was this. And I think memoirs kind of lend themselves to a more podcasting style of audiobook, which is something I do like to listen to. But I really enjoyed all of the honest insight into the complexities of her life about how being adopted is not like a binary good or bad thing. It, it's complex, which makes sense, but I don't think you get that narrative in the media very often, especially from a person of color adopted by white parents. And then even the reunion with her birth family is complicated. It's not like this big Hollywood ending. So I enjoyed learning about that and hearing about that. I think it went a little long for my taste is probably the only reason I've like knocked off half a star but I'm really glad that I finally picked this book up. Okay, this next one is Wild Seed by Octavia Butler. I really liked this book. I think when I finished it, I gave it four stars, but maybe by the time you're seeing it, it has four and a half stars, because the more I think about this book, the more I like it. So, <laughs> how to describe this story? Well, you have, I think her name is Anyanwu. I've never tried to really say it out loud before. And she is this woman who is basically immortal or has been around for hundreds of years. And she's a healer, she's a caretaker, and one day meets this other immortal being, Doru, who's thousands of years old. And he's kind of like so old, he's forgotten about his humanity and kind of what I interpret is playing a game of Sims with people and trying to kind of breed the certain combination of powers into people. Because this is a world where people can have powers, kind of like what Anyanwu and Doro have. And Anyanwu kind of meets this person and is trying to protect her family and kind of goes along. And it takes place over, I think, hundreds of years, maybe 300 total. You get different points in early, early America history. And you see her as a mother figure a lot and her struggles with figuring out what to do because there's a lot of hard compromises she has to make. And it's just really about these two people and what happens when they meet and how that relationship evolves and the complexities of it. And it's definitely the start of something. I do like it as a contained story, but if it being the start of the Patternist series chronologically, it's not the first book, has me so pumped to read the other books. I think the next one chronologically is Mind of My Mind, which I'm really excited to pick up. I love Octavia Butler's voice when she writes. I think it is purposefully very minimalistic and direct but still evokes a lot of emotion for me and really gives my brain space to like imagine things and connect the material it's so good and you can see so many of the thematic influence of it in other sci-fi works that I really connect with and really love one of which is the next one we'll talk about Sorrowland by River Solomon I have a review for this, so I will try to keep this brief and direct you towards that but this is a new release, it came out May 4th I loved it. So I have read An Unkindness of Ghosts, I've read The Deep, I have liked both of those, but this one's my favorite. I say that even though I think I technically gave The Deep a higher rating than Sorrowland, but that was rating The Deep amongst novellas and I'm rating Sorrowland amongst novels. It's complicated. Rating books is really hard, (laughs) but 
I really loved Sarland, mainly because it did have the thematic content I was expecting from a River Solomon work, uh, at least based off what I had read previously. And that's definitely there, lots of themes of motherhood and survival. I go into a whole list in my review. There are so many things, but motherhood is a big part. Your starting scene is this 15-year-old woman, I believe she's 15, in a forest giving birth to her twins. That's where we start. So you never, you, you start the, this book when she becomes a mother. And the story goes from there. And not only was it as introspective as I expected it to be, and had really great writing, very sarcastic quips that I really always enjoy when authors bring that in for their thematic messaging. I don't know. I think I'm finding that I like that more and more. It had such a fast paced, creepy, awesome plot. Like I was so engaged with the mystery of it all and what was going down and what's going to happen to our cast. There was found family I wasn't expecting. There were so many moments that I would text my friend who had read the book and I was like, oh my gosh, this just happened. My heart, my heart is so soft, which was not a sentence I was expecting to say while reading A River Solomon because An Unkindness of Ghost is a much harsher story, I feel, when it comes to interpersonal relationships with characters. It's a very bleak world. And this one's not necessarily lighter, but it, it had some more hope and lightness in it, if that makes sense. Uh, yeah, it was a great, creepy, fun time, <laughs> which is also not a thing I think of very often. And reading it right after reading Wild Sea, just the thematic overlap was really nice. And they have different writing styles, but like, I would categorize it in a similar like type of genre blend of sci-fi fantasy stuff like in terms of that space and the last one i think is also like something i would combine with it was my reread of the fifth season i finished it this morning guys <laughs> if you don't know the fifth season the, you get multiple perspectives but your first perspective is a soon who is a grieving mother so and her whole plot is driven by the fact that she wants to find her daughter um, so that's, that's the whole like point of her plot. And that's why I think motherhood's a huge theme in that book. Although there's a lot, there's a lot in the fifth season. I have my where to start with NK Jemison that I made because of the fifth season. I have a Jemison chat video with world hoppers. I, I don't know how to describe how much I love the writing style of NK Jemison. I think it is, again, also pretty minimalistic at times, but purposefully so, but also so bitingly sarcastic. I think the way Jemison handles traumatic scenes and moments is a lot like how I personally in my life manage it, which is like, okay, I am recognizing that this bad thing has happened, but now I need to internalize it and make kind of a joke or make less of it, because there are a lot of jokes that like kind of come out of nowhere, a lot of wordplay that I really love. She definitely also does this thing where you'll read a sentence and there's something in parentheses. And uh, I think it almost borderlines on stream of consciousness at times, but not quite. But it does it in a way where like, it, it works perfectly for my brain. Like my brain is able to absorb the sentences flawlessly and I love it and it's so good. <laughs> it's so good. Like, and because it is so different and unique and such a strong voice, I do understand that if you read it and you're like, this, this voice, this writing style is not working for me, I get why the book doesn't work. That's, it's such a strong, unique voice. That's part of the material I and mean, also a huge part of why I like it. I cannot wait to continue with the Obelisk Gate. Oh, it's so good. I'm so glad I reread it. I was so nervous because, you know, in the time that I first read it and now there's been like 120 books or 150 books and I'm like, am I still going to love it? Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, I could just read Jemison every day for the rest of my life and probably be a very, very happy person. All right, now we're going to get into maybe less thematically based categories, more genre based sci-fi. So I read three sci-fi books that weren't already mentioned in the above category, which were like kind of sci fantasy genre blendy things. And we'll start with The Stars Are Legion by Cameron Hurley, a book that I was excited to read after finishing The Light Brigade, which I really liked. I don't have like a review for it or anything because I read it before book two, but I like The Light Brigade. I think it's really fun and has stuck with me longer than I expected. The Stars Are Legion is weird. Um, it is an incredibly confusing world building style and that's by design your main character has amnesia. There's actually two main point of views but you spend most of your time with Zan. Zan doesn't know anything. <laughs> and Zan doesn't do a lot of internal questioning enough for my taste. I have a lot of issues with the character of Zan. 
I did not connect with them and they were the main character and they were first person point of view. And then our other character, Jade, I liked the point of view more because I got to learn things, but I didn't really like Jade. And I think my lack of connecting to the characters really hampered my enjoyment because although the world is so weird and it was so kind of cool to figure out what this world is and what's going on and why has the memory been gone, like the there are so many cool mysteries to unpack. But because I didn't care about Xan or Jade, I didn't really care about what was happening. Like, there were lots of mysteries and I cared enough to solve those mysteries and I mostly got the answers I wanted. But before the most part, it was kind of just rough character work for me, which I could see it working for other people. Um, and like part of that is Zan has no memory. So Zan, it, like I, I hesitate to say has no personality, but in Zan's defense, they don't know who they are. So it's hard to have a personality when that's the premise. But I just don't think it worked really well for me. And like... I, I started to like Xan more in the middle to the end, especially when new characters were brought in and we got like a little bit of found family going on. But I also was just like, there came a point where the thematic content became much louder and not in a way that I liked because before that everything was so confusing and a lot of things are left unclear. But for this to be like, Megahorn, listen to me. I was just like, this is jarring. <laughs> and also... I don't know if I agree with this portrayal of this thematic content. Like, I agree with it, but I'm not, like, I'm confused because I don't understand everything, and I'm sure the author does. It's, it's an experience, <laughs> that's for sure. I am glad I read it for, like, the Reddit bingo. I don't really know who to recommend this to. Uh, I think a lot of people I was buddy reading this with were struggling. Only one other person's finished, and she also agreed that this is not as good as The Light Brigade. That's Lena from Sufficiently Advanced Lena. I'll have her link down below because I'm sure she'll talk about it in her like weekly wrap-up series sometime soon. It, it was just a weird time. Um, but that was the first sci-fi that I'll want to talk about. And then we got Never Let Me Go by... I can never say his name. So I'm not going to because I'm just going to butcher it. But I read this again for the Asian Readathon. And this is a book that a friend recommended to me a couple years ago. And I was I was intrigued, but I was also like... I don't know, overwhelmed by other books that I wanted to read. But I saw it at the bookstore. I needed, I don't know, I was like book shopping and I was like, you know, this isn't that long. I bet I could squeeze it in for the Asian readathon. So I read it. Now, this is a book people are always like, don't know anything about it, which I do think is true. It's kind of interesting. But at the same time, I do think you need to know it's a literary fiction first and foremost. Any other genre you hear tied to this book, like what I'm putting it in is sci fi, is there. But that's not the point. It's a literary fiction, which if you don't read a lot of literary fiction means it's not necessarily going to have your normal plot beats or narrative structure because that's not the point. It's exploring something else and it's sometimes doing it in more experimental ways. I don't know. Literary fiction is hard to describe. I just know it when I see it. And that's what that's what this is. And something I really liked is that you're really following this woman. Think about her life and her relationship with her two friends. That at its core, that's what's on the back of the book. That's what I can tell you. And I think re regardless of thinking of any of the other components that people are like go in blind for, these relationships were really relatable and real. And I enjoyed watching them evolve over the years. And I liked that it was kind of told in a memoir-like style where you really are hearing it from this one character's point of view. And I do think that there was an interesting intention put into this story in the personalities of the characters that we're following in the situation we learn that they are in. So overall, the longer I sit with it, the more that I really do appreciate and like it. It's, it's not my favorite thing. And what was weird is I enjoyed reading it more on my phone when I had breaks in the passages than when I had a wall of text because of the um, authorial voice, the literary style, because it has longer form sentences. But when those sentences were made into little paragraph chunks, my brain did better with it. I really don't know the science behind that, but it's what happened. And I'm just, I'm glad, I'm glad I read it. And yeah, just know if you go into it, it is oddly a page turner for the slow paced story. And it has weird stuff happening. And depending on how familiar you are with science fiction, I think whether or not you're going to catch on is going to vary at what moment in the story you're like, oh, this is happening. I happen to catch on 
maybe the first chapter, but like I consume so much sci-fi visually and in literature, but that didn't bother me. And I knew this going in. It's like, if this book is only the twist or whatever people are talking about, then it's not a good book. <laughs> and it's not. It's really about these relationships. And these relationships are so fulfilling to follow, regardless of this nebulous quality that I can't talk to you about. <laughs> the last science fiction we'll talk about is The Space Between Worlds. I do have a review for this, so I will link that up in the card so you can look at that. This is a story of multidimensional travel, except you can't travel unless you're dead. I'm, I'm sure... By now, you maybe have heard of it, but I had a great time with it. It's a great short science fiction, but that also was a lot more introspective than I expected it to be. And because of the authorial voice, I really liked it. I liked following our main character. I think her name's Kara. I'm not good at remembering characters' names, and I finished this like on May 2nd. And I really liked watching her journey as she tries to figure out where she belongs and like where her place is in society. And as we learn about stuff because she goes out on a job, goes to another world, learns some interesting things and the plot proceeds. And I just, I felt very comfortable in it. I really enjoyed re the act of reading it while I was reading it. So if you want to hear more thoughts, I will just point you to that review. It's a really great new science fiction release. It came out, I believe, 2020. I think fall, maybe late summer. And I, I just, I recommend trying it out. It might not work for you because if you go into it, it might not be as fast paced as you expect. For me, it was fast paced, but then became medium paced. And after I got over this one plot point that I thought was boring, it just was like amazing. <laughs> I don't know. I just, I really appreciated after I read it. I was just like, what did I read? And I was like, that was good. <laughs> Not that I was expecting it to be bad, but it was just such a wonderful experience. All right. Oh, this video is getting long. We have six books left. We're going to first talk about two middle grades. One, Sea of Monsters, the second Percy Jackson book. I read the first Percy Jackson book way last year. I switched to audiobook for this year because I needed it for the Reddit bingo board. You needed chapter titles. I ignore me. Um, I don't know what to say about Percy Jackson. It's a middle grade story about the demigods, children of Olympians. And it's fun. So far, it's relatively predictable, formulaic, but I did the audiobooks. And I think that's how I'm going to do it because it was really fun to listen to an audiobook for me. I was able to listen to it really fast. It was pretty engaging, but it also didn't take like all of my brain because of the predictability. I also like that I waited a year to read this one because I was... I don't think I was burnt out on the formula because it's definitely very similar to the first book, which I don't like as much as this one, which I do think's a hot take. But I think the reason why I liked this reading experience more was because I did it through audiobook and because I knew what was what I was in for. Like I just, I just knew. And I also went into this one with very low expectations because everyone's like, Sea of Monsters sucks. And I'm like, okay. So excited to slowly through the years occasionally pick up an audiobook of another Percy Jackson book, but... That's all I have to say about that one. It, it's a very popular, beloved middle grade. So, but if you don't want a formulaic, predictable middle grade, I don't think this is where you want to be. But I do like all of the Greek mythology stuff because I'm a Greek mythology nerd. So, like, I think one of the camp counselors was, um, oh, I can't, I'm blanking on the name, but it's like the person in uh, Tartarus who can't, like, eat any food. <laughs> And I'm like, oh, I remember that guy. It's so cool that he's here. And the jokes around it, like, it's kind of like watching a Disney movie. And you're like, oh, this joke really works for me. I don't know if it works for kids, but it works great for me. It was, it was one of those things. And the next one, I'm putting it as middle grade, although I think it's technically classic children. But that's Anne of Green Gables, which I read because of my patrons, they voted for this. And I read it. And thank you. I needed this piece of joy. I started doing this thing where I would read it after work every day in this nice little sunspot in my apartment till the sun went away. <sighs> Anne's a delight, as Stephanie always says. And I identify so much with Anne, even though Anne is a character created in the earliest, early 20th century, <laughs> you know, and I'm a 21st century woman. I just, her curiosity, her ambition, uh, I just, I really enjoyed reading her like the story itself is definitely an early 1900s classic kids story it reminded me a lot of little house on the prairie and little women although i do think a little more accessible than those were for me but it was very day in the life of Anne. sometimes mischief was afoot sometimes sad or happy things happened and i liked the episodic nature of the chapters and just following Anne. i'm just glad i met her that's just 
the wonderful point I'm going to take away from this, I don't think I would have ever met Anne if not for this. And yeah, it's just, that's like the story of the month is like, man, I'm really glad I finally did the thing. Means I should just prioritize things I want to do more often, right? And now let's get into the next category, which is the rest of the fantasy books that I haven't mentioned. We'll start with The Empress of Salt and Fortune, which I talk about in the reading vlog. So I'll, I keep saying I'll try and be brief. Am I being brief? I don't know. There's so many books. But this is a novella, the start of a, a series of novellas that has gotten more novellas. And basically, we're recounting a time in history and we're learning about it by kind of excavating this building. And it's told in a very storyteller fashion. And it's about the politics of this fantastical place. And I thought my main takeaway was that the world building is so tight and well done for the like 110 pages you get. And I was really intrigued and I really like it. Excited to reread it one day. I have the second book on my Kindle, so I'm excited to read that. So those are my brief thoughts there. You can check out the vlog for more. And then the next one is The Mad Ship, which I just posted yesterday, three days ago. Today, the day I'm filming this, but not the day you're seeing it, <laughs> a spoiler video chat about it because I just wanted to talk about all my favorite bits. I like it just as much as Ship of Magic. I just think it does everything Ship of Magic does. It just continues to do that. Great character work, great tension, great like immersive stuff. I, what else can I say? You, I think if you read Ship of Magic, you'll know if you'll want to read Mad Ship. I don't know, like, if your issues are with characters in Ship of Magic, I do know one character that grows quite a bit that people typically dislike. So there's that. But, like, overall, it's still the same style of character work. It's still the same style of writing. It's still the same political situation. Um, I, I just, there were so many things that I wanted to happen in Ship of Magic that finally happened in the Mad Ship, so that really excited me. It's just a great, slow-paced, like, dense fantasy book with, like, like, that great writing. I don't know how to describe it. It's just, like, the perfect sit in a room, read a bunch of pages, and you'll still have a bunch of pages left to read for weeks, and it's, like, the best feeling. I enjoyed reading Mad Ship, and I cannot wait for Ship of Destiny. I keep looking to see if I can afford hardback versions of these books, which I cannot, but I keep looking because that's how much I've been enjoying the Live Ship Trader series. All right, home stretch. We got two more, <laughs> and this is historical fiction. And the first one is The Ghost Bride, which I talked to at length in the reading vlog. This is the first book I read in that vlog. This is a weird book. <laughs> this is a book that starts gothic and then tonally shifts dramatically. Um, this takes place in Malacca, which is a part of Malaysia. In the 1800s, we have a woman who basically gets prepositioned by a house to be the ghost bride of this son that passed away. And she does not want to be a ghost bride. And the story kind of goes from there. It's, I, I don't know how to describe the majority of this story without spoiling a thing. <laughs> but I, so just know that if you want to learn about Malaysia in like that time period, it's gonna be really interesting for you. I do like the main character, although she is a little naive and there is a huge tonal shift. And that tonal shift mileage for you is gonna vary dramatically. I at first was like, what? But then I was like, oh, and I'm fine with it. But I can see other people never being okay with that shift. Like if what you love so much at the beginning is that like gothic feel, don't get attached, <laughs> I guess is what I would say. And I, I generally really liked it though. What I wanted from it was to get a better sense of the atmosphere and history of Malaysia, just like a taste. And that's what I got. So again, we'll refer you to the vlog for more in-depth thoughts. It, it was it was fun. It was almost exactly what I wanted. And I do want to look at the Netflix show that I do think came out for it. And the last one I just finished a couple days ago is Run Me to Earth by Paul Yoon. This is for my book club. And I wanted to get it done before the June readathon because it wasn't going to fit any prompts. And it was only like a six hour audiobook. And this is about a country, Laos, which I didn't know... I, well, I'll be honest, I didn't know it was a country. Um, I don't know a lot of the countries in Southeast Asia. And this is a country that is just north of Vietnam and was heavily used by the U.S. during the Vietnam War as part of that strategy, I guess, for lack of a better word. And we are following these three children who basically are helping the Hmongs and the United States in this time period where the United States themselves are bombing Laos, like 
so so much it's it's really horrible um and you go through different parts of time and it's hard for me to wrap my head around my feelings for it there were definitely moments that were such gut punches to me that i was like oh no but also because each time period was a different character perspective, I didn't get to latch on to a character, but I did feel like I had a better understanding of the people. Like if each character was meant to represent a larger group, I kind of understood a better picture of the whole. I am excited to discuss this at our book club to see what other people took away. Like there were passages that I really loved reading. I think it really evoked certain atmospheres. I definitely was educated in things that I didn't know about. So it was, it was a good short historical fiction that taught me things. It was also very tragic because <laughs> it just, war is never pleasant, right? Especially when it feels needless and especially when you don't know what your country's done. Like, there's a lot of things I know, but I always, you know, every day you, you learn a new thing that your tax dollars get paid for, and you're just like, really? That's what we're paying for? I don't approve of that. How do I more loudly tell you that I don't approve of that? And, like, you know, I call my representatives and I write them letters, but, you know, all you can do is keep trying, but it, that, that's kind of what the book reminded me of, is just, like, how many things happen when you're not looking. Kind of ending on a downer there, but it was one of the more recent books I've read. I cannot believe how many things that I've read this month, and I'm sorry this is a longer wrap-up than normal, but I, I did try to talk as fast as I could without losing important content. And if you've made it this far, tell me down in the comments what your favorite read was of the month, and if you want to leave an emoji, leave one of a ghost for the ghost pride. <laughs> I feel like I keep giving people unseasonable <laughs> emojis. If you saw the Monday video, I have a different unseasonable emoji for that one. And like if you liked it, subscribe if you want to, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye. Mm -hmm.